Cool, and then just pull that a little bit. Cool. And we're live. Uh, this is the very first ever uh, Liquor Store Podcast. Liquor ep- Store Podcast. Episode one. <laughs> Why, what are we doing? Are we... <laughs> this is your idea. <laughs> Why are we here? Um, well, we'll just introduce ourselves. I think that would be the best thing to do. My, uh, my name is Matt Colblazer, and I'm Jill Pianta. I'm, I work for Big Red Liquors. I work here for nine years now. I just had my nine year anniversary. Um, and uh, the reason for doing this is oddly enough, in conversations with lay people or civilians, as we might call them, who are not in the liquor business, <laughs> we always end up talking about alcohol. Yes. And everybody just wants to talk about alcohol. And, they do. And our business and how to get uh, Pappy and what people drink and on and on and on. So I thought we would do. I thought we'd kick this podcast off by maybe talking about why we got into the business and a little bit about ourselves uh, so people kind of know our perspective and where we're coming from. And then uh, we've got some, you know, random stuff. It's probably, I don't know, I mean, I know your office is like this too, but <laughs> this is like 10, this is probably like a 5% of what <laughs> our horribly crowded offices look like at any given time. This is just a, a, the corner of my yeah. desk. <laughs> there's always a bunch of stuff to uh, to be interested in and check out. And um, I should mention that today, I mean, we're still looking for sponsors, so if anybody wants to sponsor the show, <laughs> you know, knock yourselves we'll out. give you a shout out. But today we're going to be sponsored by Big Rocks, which is uh, a product of we sell at Big Red Liquors. Uh, it's just a giant two by two ice cube, which is hand carved by Indiana's premier ice sculptor, premier ice sculptor, Stefan Cook, and uh, <laughs> uh, he he carves swans and for <laughs> shrimp cocktails and other things like that. But fancy ice luges. He, he also made these like beautiful two by two by two ice cubes for us. So uh, he, he hand carves them. And, Visually wraps them and you can take them out of there and here I'll hold this up to the mic so people can get a nice <laughs> clink sound. And the cool part about these ice cubes is that he uses reverse osmosis water, which isn't that special. Like every brewery, every distillery, they all use RO water. Every restaurant. Yep, everybody does. <laughs> um, but in order to get the ice like crystal clear, you have to use like an agitator essentially like brings all the bubbles to the surface from the bottom of these like giant freeze tubes and then you get a 300 pound block of ice that is like two feet thick and you can literally see right through it like glass so when you pour the liquid on top of this which we'll do here in a minute <laughs> you'll see that uh you you can see like right down through the two inch ice cube uh, and it melts a little slower and it's fun. So it's like at a bar or you're hosting a party at your house. Somebody says, you want a big rock? And they go, what the hell is that? <laughs> of course, they're going to say yes. And of course, they're going to want it. So you can get big rock at Big Red Liquors. <laughs> there you go. That's our sponsor today. So <laughs> thanks, Big Rock. <laughs> thanks, Big Rock. All right. So Jill, um, why don't you tell me a little bit about your background, why you got into this business, what you love about it, what you like to drink? Um, I started in the liquor industry uh, right after college. Um, I wanted to uh, be a ski bum, so I became a server. Um, I had to learn about wine, so living in Breckenridge, Colorado, I um, worked at the restaurant, had to learn about wine, realized that um, certain Chardonnays tasted differently, differently from each other, and the reason why was because of where they're grown. So I went down that rabbit hole, if you will, um, and uh, Moved back to Chicago in 2005, got my job, myself a job at a distributor, hated that. Um, and then I, I actually fell into retail, which is where my passion is. Um, I really love talking to people about wine. Um, it's just a lot of fun for me. Um, I moved to Indianapolis in 2015, um, and I uh, started working for Big Red Liquors about a year later. Um, Managed a store, managed one of the vine and tables, and then um, now I'm the wine specialist because I just love talking about wine so much. It can happen. <laughs> what do you think the percentage of people who end up in wine retail in liquor stores started out in the restaurant business? Um, I mean, it would. I would have to say like 
a good majority of them because the hours are better. You don't make as much money, but it's really about the quality of life. <laughs> and there's a lot of drama in the restaurant business. Correct? There certainly Interpersonal is. Interpersonal drama. It certainly is. Um, you know, if you've ever seen that movie Waiting, it's a really great representation of a restaurant <laughs> restaurant oh, but culture. I, no, but I do like watching the Psalm films. I think they're I think they're kind of fun. I don't know what your take. We've never talked about that. I don't know what your take is on those people, but. Um, well, I, you know, living in Chicago and I worked with a lot of, the, a lot of Psalms, I've um, watched a lot of my friends become advanced sommeliers. Um, it is a very intense world. Um, it's, it's a lifestyle. Uh, you basically uh, live, eat, drink wine, literally. Um, and uh, it's really intense. Um, I've taken the CSW, so I'm a certified specialist of wine. That's, you know good for me i will i do want to take go on the master of wine program but um you know i, I mean i'm not a sommelier I, I don't want to work in a restaurant so um but you know kudos to those who like that lifestyle i just i it's just not for me but you know i appreciate the dedication that it takes um to, to get to that level i really do it didn't seem to me like the people in the movie really wanted to stay psalms like the whole point was <laughs> become master sommelier get really famous and then you know <laughs> go work for a wine brand where the hours are maybe a little bit better and the money's a lot better and you're not working for like an overlord gm who's telling you what to do every day <laughs> Um, I, I think there's a statistic that's about 2% of master sommeliers actually still work on the floor. So that is kind of right. the ironic part about it. It's um, like bartenders. Like I remember when I was a kid, well now bartenders are these, you know, these beings celebrities. behind bars. <laughs> but I remember when I was a kid, I mean, we watched the commercials on TV and it was like neon lights and it was like, choo -choo -choo, be a bartender and go to bartender school. <laughs> and I just thought... Okay, well, I don't think I'd want to be a bartender, <laughs> but uh, that's all changed now. So it really has. I have I have a bunch of friends who are actually like really like higher end bartenders. They, I mean, they manage their bars, they create beverage programs, um, you know, and doing it in really cool places like San Francisco. I mean, it's, a, it's also a lifestyle, but it's it's a commitment. I mean, you don't really have that much of a personal life. It's right. it is it drives your life. Um, which brings us to alcohol fetish, <laughs> fetishism, because that's really what I wanted to talk about today, because uh, that's the universe in which we both operate. Um, where what's um, next? What's new? What's hot? Yeah, and like what you know, how are like how are people who drink? How are they validated by what they drink, and how that drives like so much of their interest in product, and not necessarily the uh, perception of what it really tastes like but more what can I get and how can I get it, et cetera, et cetera. Pappy being like the, yeah. the one thing and the only reason it's worth talking about today in this episode is that this, you know, the fall is in the air and so the oh. allocated bourbon season is starting. It always kicked off in early September with <laughs> birthday bourbon, which right. is a Brown Foreman Old Forester product and everybody wants to know if they can get birthday bourbon and then it kind of rolls through Pappy Season and Buffalo Trace Antique Collection and all the lotteries and all the things like that. So <laughs> I get people who are just, oh my God, they got to have a certain bottle um, when in fact, if you just would blind taste people on 10 different things and you put the birthday bourbon in one of them, you know, how many people could really identify it and say, oh yeah, that's the one. It's, it's, <laughs> I'm, you know, my taste is telling me that's, the best one here. Uh, what do you think? Zero percent is the answer. <laughs> I will give you the answer. I would think at least two percent would guess it just because, yeah, just by chance, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do think those bourbons have a, you know, a different mouthfeel, different flavor profile, but I don't know if, I mean, I've tasted a lot of bourbons in my day, and I don't know if I could pick them out, but I do know a good bourbon when I try one. Right. So there's that. But you're not like a validation drinker. <laughs> no, I drink Or a validation available. eater. <laughs> or a fetishizer of stuff. Are you? I don't think so. Yeah, you probably are, since you're, <laughs> since you're in this business. Well, if it comes to white burgundy, then yes. <laughs> anyway, that is what I would suggest. If, if there's anybody out there who uh, is lucky enough to win a bottle, a, a highly allocated bottle in one of these lotteries, you know, 
go go to go to this liquor store, grab five other things that you can buy right off the shelf, pour them right next to each other, and taste them side by side, and really try to determine, you know, have have your buddy mix them up and figure out if you can tell the difference. <laughs> and then take a chill pill. <laughs> People still say that. <laughs> you're dating, take, take you're dating us, Matt. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, then you go and you know, buy a regular bottle of Maker's Mark every once in a while and, and pour it over a big rock and enjoy it. So, <laughs> big rock's the important thing. Yeah. So yeah, that's the one. I'm, that's the next one I'm dreading is the is the um, the old Forrester Berkeley bourbon, which is named after um, George Garvin Brown, uh, founder of Brown Foreman. It, it celebrates his birthday. And what's cool about that one is that they always pick a specific lot from one distilling day. So actually, it's not even like a good marker of quality because they have to find, they can't even blend barrels from different days of production. They have to find like this honey moment, you know, where 20 barrels on a given day represented like the best stuff. And then they pluck that out and then they. But you that's don't think that's like kind of neat? I do think it's neat. Thing. <laughs> yes, I do think it's, but I think, you know, when you're looking at putting together these like highly allocated bourbons, you think, oh, I want to draw from like the widest palette of different things that I can think of, um, whether it's a 15 year or 20 year or a nine year or a combination of those things. But this is like one distilling day to celebrate, you know, their founder's birthday, which I do think is pretty cool. So um, some years are hit and miss. But this year, I think, is the highest proof ever. So that means the... the it's a fire year. Yeah, pe well, no. People are going to just <laughs> be... more like fire? No, people are just going to want it at, like, an insane level. So I'm preparing for that, which will be fun. So, um, so we could talk about things like that in the wine world. We can. Or we could talk about the claw. Oh, we can talk about it. <laughs> I think people want to talk about white claw. <laughs> I just think they do. So that was, this was the high and the low. So <laughs> I, White Claw is my early 20s, basically. If they would have had this when I was like 21, 22. Like my life would have been like so much easier. <laughs> have you ever had a White Claw? Um, no. That's I've never part. had one. It, all right. I have zero, I have zero White Claws in my whole life. I feel like we're about to have one. Yeah. I feel like that's more of a challenge. Which one do you want? Um, I like raspberry or lime. You have like cherry nuts. I get raspberries. It's the worst. So why? <laughs> People right. love the black raspberry. I know. I'm sure they. Okay. We're gonna open our white claws at the same time. Not to make any noise here. Go ahead. Uh -oh. <laughs> so why do people like this stuff? It smells like raspberry. It's fruity. It's easy to drink. Do you think it's Lacroix? <laughs> I think it's like Lacroix craze. It kind of like paved the way. I think it's the this stuff. The, uh, like, the oh, I can't drink regular Coke anymore because I don't want to be fat. So I'll drink Diet Coke. Oh, it turns out Diet Coke will give you cancer. So I need to drink something else. <laughs> oh my God! Now we're like scraping the bottom of the barrel. We're like okay with Lacroix. Jesus. No, we, I think. And now we have this. Now we're putting alcohol in. I think it, it's, of it's only five percent, so you can drink it all day. <laughs> and uh oh my god it tastes like nothing oh well, right it's like sparkly water which Actually, it kind of tastes like a gummy what kind of gummy i oh, know i have an eight <laughs> i have an eight-year-old so i eat a lot of gummy uh, i eat a lot of gummy shaped foods you can't say that <laughs> these days <laughs> um I, I mean it's it's a vodka it's like a watered down vodka soda um with a little bit of flavor which i could appreciate that that's refreshing <laughs> five percent alcohol Five percent alcohol, so you know you don't get too loopy. Twelve ounces, hundred calories. I mean, I think you know. I think we're just more health conscious these days. Yeah, so. I think people like that measurability of things. You know, I think that's where, like, some of the marijuana stuff becomes a little trickier. You know, as that becomes a big topic, it's yeah. like, how much is like a dose? You know, like right. most people, if you're at a concert and you're hanging out, and you're drinking, and you drink like five white claws, you would. Yeah. Go okay. I know what that feels like. Right. Five white claws. And like when you're pouring drinks, you okay. know, at my house, it's an unmeasured experience. Okay. Christopher Cross <laughs> album. That's what that feels like. Actually, it's not bad. I mean, I don't know that I would. I don't know that I would buy these personally, but I can totally see the appeal. Like on a boat. 
you know, or just like hanging out on the porch. So people should know one of the first things I do when I get up in the morning. <laughs> what time do you get up? I set my alarm at 5.15. 6.15. Okay, so I roll over. I grab my <laughs> laptop. I used to have my, I will tell you the secret. <laughs> this is terrible. I'm telling a secret to a whole bunch of people. I used to have my Keurig machine on my nightstand. <laughs> I did this for like a year. And it got, I mean, it was a little crazy. Because <laughs> you just slam the thing down, and then the coffee starts going. I mean, it wasn't like, it wasn't like decorator show house. Okay? Did you like set so it I up was slamming down the keg. And like had the water. Yes, I had the pot. <laughs> oh yeah, you have to. Full of water, coffee cup, pod, ready to go. So my alarm would go off, I'd roll over and just, and then percolates and grab my laptop. The first thing I do is I look at sales. So I look at sales for the day, what the margin was, um, beer sales, spirit sales, wine sales, and then I like organize them by dollars and by units. That takes about 15 minutes. That's like, <laughs> while I'm drinking coffee, that's the fun part. You know, did we have a good day or did it rain? Was it terrible? <laughs> Am I going to catch shit at the office? What is it going to be? So, anyway, for the last week, um, White Claw has been, by dollars, our number one selling item. So people don't know, like before this, it's like Bud Light 24 packs, Bush Light 30 packs. It is now White Claw, and that has happened. So I mean, the cultural moment of White Claw has definitely <laughs> it's, arrived. It's hitting its peak. It's in its moment. It's peak Claw. <laughs> Are you calling Peak Claw? <laughs> peak, we're Peak Clawing right now. <laughs> I'm ready to call it. Do Claw? <laughs> What's a Do Claw? You're, you have cats, right? I, Isn't that yeah, a thing? it's a thing on dogs and cats. It's like they're like thumb, but it's, you know, not working. Oh, that's a good idea for Mountain Dew. <laughs> the Do Claw. The Do Claw. Um, <laughs> I'm trademarking that. <laughs> that's good. It's like I think thousand dollar idea. Yeah. Okay, so then, um, yeah, so we're getting ready for uh, happy season. That'll be fun always you make some people really happy and you make other people really pissed off and that's just the way that goes um just proves yet again that life is not fair oh people do ask me how how can they get that well just spend a hundred thousand dollars at your local liquor store that's so <laughs> easy it's the easiest path to getting a bottle of happy um otherwise <laughs> it's probably a lot so then um the other thing that came across my desk this week was blackened which is this is the Metallica whiskey. Oh. Oh. No. Yeah. I'll drink my white claw. Drink your claw. Get yourself a big rock. All right, big. And I'm going to pour you a little sample of this. Um, <laughs> so Blackened is the new Metallica whiskey. And I say that because I'm obviously like a big, definitely a part of the... Oh, nice. Nice <laughs> They're definitely part of the brand story, obviously. And it, this is obviously not the first like celebrity alcohol that you and I have interacted with. Uh, what are some famous ones? Probably Casamigos. Casamigos. I never did get to meet George Clooney, but which George Clooney and Randy Gerber and Randy sold Gerber. for? They sold it to Diageo for a ridiculous amount of money. So they made some good money doing that. And they get to drink their own tequila. <laughs> yeah, which is just like. You know, a couple of managers and some liquor store guys going, hey, let's go down to one of these <laughs> distilleries, pick out some good tequila, put your name on it, go around, brand ambassador for a couple of years, here's a $500 million check. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good deal, I would think. So there's that one. It's the dream. So I think that one worked probably because the image matched up with like the fun of the brand. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like Casamigos wasn't meant to be taken super seriously. Mm -hmm. It was like these two good look, looking super rich guys were married, <laughs> both married to like supermodels and hanging out. Like, it was yeah, that was next to each other in Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are some other ones that are out right now? Uh, I think Ryan Reynolds is doing Aviation Gin. Um, Greg Norman Wine. <laughs> that's, a, that's dating. There's the Perry yeah. Farrell Master Doble. Master Doble. Oh, yeah. That's right. For the indie kids, yeah. <laughs> the Lollapalooza crowd. Well, this is, I, I think people would probably not be surprised, maybe a little bit, that this is a really common thing that we 
hear about in our business, like from the celebrities to like super A celebrities where they are super successful in one aspect of life, music, acting, whatever, very wealthy, and they want to get into the alcohol business. Mm -hmm. um, so what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it's a hobby for them, you know, it's like something to do, but they they can make a business out of it and, you know, I guess if I had the money, I would try to, you know, make my own Provence Rosé, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> or perhaps, you know, start a Barolo winery, I don't know, <laughs> find the right people to do it. Oh, I mean, like Brad and Angelina did it, you know, I mean. Yeah, that's right, do they have a Rosé, like a sparkling? They have a Rosé, they don't have a sparkling, they just have a Rosé. Okay. They have two Rosés now, but, um. I don't know. I mean, it's just another business venture. Um, it's something that everyone likes. It's re recession proof. Just whether or not your brand makes it, you know. Right. Well, I think the truth is, just as many celebrity brands fail as succeed in the same percentage as regular beer, wine, and spirits. Which the truth is, as we both know, most new brands totally fail. Yes. They are not around mm -hmm. a year a year after they launch, and this is the big guys, the little guys. So think about. The crazy popular stuff. I mean, like White Claw could have just as easily failed, and Mark Anthony, you know, the Mike's Hard Lemonade guys would have had to just move on with life. Um, well, I mean, there were many predecessors to the White Claw in years coming up to this. So, like, I mean, I think they just kind of improved upon it. Right. And because we had a we had a local brand, I think, and we that was very similar to it. The White Claw. Yeah. It was a garden party. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, and it was good stuff. It was just kind of like, I guess, ahead of its time. Ahead of its time, yeah. <laughs> no, I just think of things like, why are they popular? Like, Fireball was around for a decade or more before it became... Fireball. Like a 10 million <laughs> case brand. What what changes? I mean, it's not like a good label. It's cinnamon-flavored whiskey. <laughs> it was nothing special for 10 years, and then all of a sudden, boom, it takes off. And People can't get enough of it. I mean, same with Jameson in a way, right? Jameson yeah. went from being like this kind of just a regular old Irish whiskey to something that people would call for in bars, and it, it enters into the same realm as like you know Hennessy or Crown, where right? people who drink Crown Royal know that it's Canadian whiskey, know that it's made in like some windswept <laughs> shithole. No, I shouldn't say that. Gimli. I mean, in the middle of nowhere. Have you ever looked at like a sailor picture of that place? No, I feel like we should put one up though. No, it looks like an X-Files facility. I mean, there's just like hundreds of these giant warehouses out in the middle of the Canadian plains in the middle of nowhere. So. Not a magical place where elves are, you know, distilling the whiskey? No. Oh. That's Crown Royal. <laughs> so I don't know. That's the weird thing. People ask me like, what makes a brand successful? What makes something really awesome? I said, you know, when you when you meet the person with the magic wand, please send them in because <laughs> we just don't know sometimes. We don't know. Yeah. Oh, so then the other stuff that that I that came in. Um, oh yeah. What, what are we drinking here? This is the blackened. Yeah. Blackened. Let's take a sip. So this is a project that Metallica did with Dave Pickerel, who was famous uh, from being. Far one out. Yeah. He. He, uh, he did pass away, unfortunately, this year, but um, he was the master distiller at Maker's Mark for a number of years, and then kind of went on to do this sort of uh, traveling master distiller job where he would yeah. consult with brands. I mean, basically, a bunch of investment guys had some money and needed to contact, and uh, he, he helped start Whistle Pig, so he's, you know, he's the guy that knows where the good 10 year old Canadian whiskey was at that point and what, how to blend it, how to get to a flavor profile that would be popular and, a, and how to make the price point profitable, I'm guessing. <laughs> right? I think it's pretty excited or expensive, it is guess, expensive. but people buy it, right. so there's that, yeah. you know? Well, you guys gotta do the math. Like if you are buying X number of barrels of 10 year old whiskey, you know, that's gonna be X more expensive than a one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old if you're bottling it. So, you know, you just can't be at a $40 price point. So, uh, right. but that's what makes, that's what creates value for brands is the, the higher price point. For sure. So, what do you think of this? It's pretty good. It is I, actually pretty good. I think some, I think one of our, 
one of our folks who was uh, who I was talking to online the other day was saying that Dave at some point did admit that this was MGP. So for people who don't know what MGP is, uh, Midwest Grain Products is a company that was based in Kansas but bought this old Seagram's distillery in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, and a ton of craft whiskey comes out of there. So it's, they make all the whiskey. They do. <laughs> and you know what's crazy is that it's really unfortunate. So as people were like uncovering these facts from like, you know, from the bourbon nerd world, and I would certainly put myself in that category. Um, You're like your leader. No. <laughs> but uh, that it, it got kind of glossed over a little bit that it is probably one of the one of the best, most consistent distilleries in the United States. I mean, if you look at the big Kentucky distilleries, you know, Wild Turkey, Jim Beam, Maker's Mark, et cetera, et cetera, you would have to put a Lawrenceburg facility up there with all of them. But what it was really known for was a blended whiskey, <laughs> Seagram 7, with a case of Seagram's gin. Lumpy face. Ever <laughs> made has come out of Lawrenceburg, Indiana, so. <laughs> MGP juice finished in black and brandy cast. I don't know what that means. Do you ever read something on a label and you're like, <laughs> yeah, mostly, it, mostly in whiskey. <laughs> like, I know everything about alcohol. That doesn't mean anything. It was swam through by mermaids. I don't know what that means. Right. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know, so I'm not worried about it because they don't really explain it on there. But I mean, once you blacken the cask, though, it kind of uh, doesn't like new like make it neutral and kind of like we move on i don't know i don't know i mean yeah. if you look at a number four char inside of a barrel it's really black already i don't know how you could char it any more than that and i think if you char it to like a seven or eight the weight of the juice like breaks the barrel and falls apart <laughs> so it must mean something else it must there must be juice within the walls of the barrel something that makes it special makes it different but um it's pretty good yeah it's like lighter, um, has kind of more uh, corn brainy notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little fruit driven because it's got some of that brainy cask in it, so it's not bad. But um, what did you bring? Because I think you brought a wine here to talk about. <laughs> Is this something you're actively drinking or just something that you like? Well, you know, I've had this love hate relationship with Pinot Grigio <laughs> over the over the years. I'm always just say I would just like you know water for adults, um, but I have to say it's the thing that I'll drink the dive bar if I don't want to have beer. I just know that the Pinot Grigio probably hasn't been open for that long, a eh? because <laughs> no one drinks Pinot Grigio in the dive bar, um, and also it's just kind of easy drinking and you can never have. I always I've always said it can never be too good, but it can never be too bad. However, I'm being proven wrong, uh, which is probably one of my favorite things about wine is that I say I don't like something and then I'm like oh I'm wrong so um, uh, this particular Donzante Pinot Grigio um, it's new to the big red um, you know shelves uh, and I have to say being like a 9.99 Pinot Grigio it's <laughs> it's pretty tasty it's not too sweet it's got some really nice um, kind of orchard fruits going on some like lemon notes but um, just really refreshing um, I, I actually have been drinking more Pinot Grigio as of late. <laughs> yeah, that's just that. true. I am admitting it because it's cold and it's in my fridge. Um, sometimes it's like the path of least resistance, not going to lie. Um, but, you know, I also just had it in my office and um, I don't know, it was the first one. It was at hand. So oh. What's like the best cheap wine? You know, like if you go to a wedding and there's three or four wines and you know they're all cheap, well, What's the I always, best varietal? I always go for cheap white price. wine. Cheap white wine is always better than cheap red wine. That's good advice. Um, yeah. Uh, Why is that? Uh, just because red wine, when it's cheap, is just awful. Like they've under the the fruits underripe. Um, they've probably ameliorated it in some way, so it has some weird like additives to it. So if you get a headache, that's probably what's going on. It's not the sulfites. Um, yeah, it, it, their red wines are just really unbalanced. White wine, I mean, if anything, it's going to be watery. And, well, I mean, <laughs> it's a step up since it's alcoholic, right? So, um, yeah, I always say that, you know, uh, when in doubt, white wine over red wine. Um, and, uh, yeah, Pinot Grigio, because if you choose Chardonnay, you can get, you know, there's a huge range of Chardonnays where you can have that, like, oaky, buttery Chardonnay or that, like, dish rag Chardonnay. 
um, that I, you know, I don't like drinking wedding Chardonnay, not, not my favorite. <laughs> so I just avoid those. Um, but yeah, I just, I go in expensive white wine. Um, so like anything that would involve a barrel or like trying to fake the flavor of oak would obviously add more expense to the production. So if you just have a wine that's like super basic white wine that doesn't need to touch oak, even if it's super cheap, at least they're not trying to like fake right something that has to be there for gonna, it to taste like cabernet yeah it's gonna taste it's gonna taste like wine it's just you know not gonna be super complex that's good advice i am going to a wedding this weekend it's really? the first wedding that i've been to in like seven years because my wife and i are in that stage between <laughs> first weddings and second weddings of our <laughs> friend group and then um this is like a this is a cousin of Lori's. So now that the cousins, the young cousins are getting older, this is like the first young cousin wedding. But, that, but just like we're talking about how everything is kind of changing and we're blurring lines of having like, you know, vodka sodas and cans and whatnot. Um, I've seen like the wedding game, the alcohol at wedding game been stepped up. Um, yeah. They have a lot more options. They have sign signature cocktails now. Right. <laughs> Which is kind of nice. Um, we have beer and wine because I thought... If you have liquor at your wedding, you're kind of inviting, you know, right, the, um, the animals to, <laughs> but, to come out <laughs> at some point. I mean, that's, you know, that's why people carry flasks at weddings. Well, remember our guy that we were talking to that had requested the Mezcal bar? Right. And we are like, there's no way a Mezcal bar at a wedding ends well. Yeah. Somebody gets stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> that's all there is. Someone's I mean, getting angry. Yeah. <laughs> there's going to be a fight. Because you know, like, because you know there's the one person with no experience who's going to be like, oh, to try them all. Yeah. And they're just <laughs> five shots of Mezcal. Right. I mean. That's not going to go well. I mean, I feel like they made the right choice by not adding to the stress of the day. Yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah, so, the, so Lori and I were talking about this. We're like, okay, what? You know, like, how many songs are they going to play at this wedding that we don't even recognize? <laughs> I bet your daughter knows. And that my daughter, who's eight, knows? Yeah. And who's, like, probably shouldn't know <laughs> what's in, in those songs. <laughs> like, any Demi Lovato song that we've listened to in the car. Oh, so you've already gone over my head. Not appropriate for <laughs> me. Oh, man. Oh, anyway. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah, we're going to a wedding, so that's a good tip. <laughs> I will definitely try the white wine before wading into... Yeah, I was at a, uh, a really fancy gala, and... Um, you know, the wine had been donated and it was a very popular grocery store brand. Um, and I just had to choose the Pinot Grigio because I'm like, well, that's the best one of that brand. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it was the right choice, I feel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I get it. Like, Yellowtail makes like 19 different wines. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if we tasted them all side by side, which future episode. Um, <laughs> future episode. Yay. That you would figure out there's probably one or two of them that are actually decent. I started drinking Yellowtail Shiraz. That was like one of my first my first go-tos. <laughs> yeah, we drank one fives of wine in college. <laughs> and smoked cigarettes. I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I went to school in Boulder. We did other things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, well, we really meandered all over the world. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tried these White Claws, which is really my goal. Yay. Uh, that was my life goal for today, so I've achieved that. Um, <laughs> Box checked. <laughs> yeah. So, what do you have coming up? What are you working on? Um, well, with the uh, changing of the seasons and uh, whiskey season coming up, we actually have the arrivals of our new Burgundy. Bur 2017 Burgundies are coming. Really excited about that. Um, They're quite delicious. Um, and then, you know, we have with that new Beaujolais are coming. Not just Beaujolais Nouveau. Um, I don't know, just it's coming into red wine season and all the new vintages are coming out, so I'm excited for new wines. So there's like Burgundy, but then there's Burgundy, right? I mean, there's like a couple of different levels in Burgundy. Yeah. So the Burgundy you're talking about is obviously I mean, when you get relatively to, affordable. Well, you know, when you get to the crew level, you know, it's you know, going to be in the 30 to sixty dollar range, and then you get to the, you know, like the monopoles and the DRCs of the world, which... I mean, I've only had once, and, well, my motto is, uh, my favorite wine is the one I can drink, so <laughs> it's the one that's right there that I can afford. 
Um, but even so, the I mean, even the nicer 2017s are great, but even the, the village level ones are delicious, so. It was a good year, a good vintage, you think? It is a great vintage, yeah. Um, so drink, like, drink 2017 Burgundy? Yeah, drink 2017 Burgundy. Okay. Find <laughs> them to sell her, too. Yeah, and maybe we'll bring some on the next show and we'll, we'll try some out. Yeah, we That'd should have fantastic. them in by then. Well, I am just, like I said, I'm gearing up for whiskey season. Um, we got some Four Roses single barrels going out. Oh, that's I've, exciting. I've got a trip planned, uh, I think in two weeks, down to Huber's, which is a small craft distillery in Starlight, Indiana, which will be a fun place to visit. So fun. Ted Huber is like a eighth, seventh generation Indiana farmer, and he's got, he makes wine, he makes whiskey, he makes all kinds of fun stuff. So I'm going to go down there. It's been... It's been a couple of years since I've been down there, but it's always like a 35 barrel tasting. Uh, yeah. So I have to really <laughs> sip. Well, that's the other thing I was going to talk about today because people always make a comment in some of my other videos where they're like, Why did you spit? And I'm like, It's 9 a.m. I have to work the rest <laughs> of the day. So I can still, you can still definitely taste everything. You still get a finish, you still get all that, even if you spit. And I always tell, you know, it's just a professional thing. Right. I mean, we have to taste a lot throughout our days sometimes. Yeah. It's just best to not swallow. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay. Well, that's it. That's our first uh, Big Red Liquors, yeah. our, our uh, liquor store podcast here. So uh, thanks for... <laughs> thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out. And uh, we, will, we will return. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Cool. It's good. We're about 37 minutes. I jotted down a ton of notes. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like that.